cordially inviting our first speaker, Nuno Morgado, um, the assistant professor from the Institute of International Political and Regional Studies at the Corvinus University Budapest and adjunct professor at the Institute of Political Studies at Schaffs University in Prague. Uh, the title of uh, his uh, presentation will be Western Europe in Changing the Portuguese Geopolitical Design Beyond the EU Membership Consensus. So, Dr. Morgado, the floor is yours, please. Can you hear me? Yes, we do. Okay, perfect. So just one second, I will just upload here my PPT. Okay, sure. And, and while you're taking your time, I'll just want to inform once again. And that can you see the PPT too? Yep. We have 10 minutes for the presentations and after okay. this session, uh, we'll have Q&A. Yeah. If we have questions, of course. Is it visible? Yes, absolutely. Yes, you can see it and uh, looks good. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much. So, as <coughs> the moderator already informed, the title of my presentation is Western Europe in Changing the Portuguese Geopolitical Design Beyond the European Union Membership Consensus. So, I am very happy to bring you here some of my research results. I would like to thank the organizers for doing such a good job and making this workshop possible. It's going very well and I'm very, very happy with the presentations that we had so far. So without further ado, I, I will just start. So the specific research problem that I bring us here today is the traditional geopolitical clash between sea and uh, land applied to foreign policy of a country, in this case Portugal. So on the one hand, Portugal is a traditional sea power throughout the centuries, until 1974, as I'm going to make the point. <clears throat> but since that date, exactly the country oriented his uh, foreign policy and his grand strategy to a land block, which is the European Union. So the objectives and the structure of my presentation today uh, are both, one, to describe Portuguese foreign policy through a geohistorical approach, so we are going to look at those centuries of uh, sea power um, policy and grand strategy, and also to formulate geostrategic scenarios and possibilities for Portugal uh, within uh, its membership uh, in the European Union, and also uh, thinking a little bit out of the box about uh, unlike possibility of Portugal leaving the EU. So, the sections will address these two objectives. First, I will contextualize Portugal uh, from the point of view of geography, identity, the foreign policy pattern of Portugal, and the foreign policy shift in 1974, and the subsequent decay of Portuguese fishing activity and Portuguese navy, which in the economy and in the military are the most important activities connected to the sea. And in the second section, which is the, the, the smallest and the one that I am still working at the moment, I will devote some analysis about the just strategic scenarios and possibilities for Portugal in the 21st century. As our co-host Dr. Okunyev mentioned, methodology is quite important for geopolitics more than ever, <coughs> since geopolitics has been under criticism and attack of critical geopolitics for some um, lack of methodological uh, thickness. So I, I present you here my theoretical and methodological framework that I use for this uh, paper. This is the model of neoclassical geopolitics that I have been developing for the last years. The model basically uh, argues that geopolitical design of foreign policy outcomes and in the line of time grand strategies, as we have also heard this morning, result from both. Uh, the relative material state potential of the country, that means a set of geopolitical factors that constitutes the capabilities of the state, but also the systemic stimuli, that means the place of the state in international relations, the opportunities and threats that this state needs to face. But those uh, sub-variables, the independent, that which compose the independent variable, 
do not necessarily determine the behavior of the state per se. So there is something here in the middle, which is the perceptions of the geopolitical agents concerning the independent variable, but also their capabilities or their capacities on how to manage resources and to pull off certain uh, foreign policy response or foreign policy outcome. So these are, uh, these are my theoretical and ecological glasses that I use to look at, um, at, at the problem. So moving forward, I uh, also had some previous research, actually, uh, it was part of the, of the research project that Thomas Weiss was uh, mentioning in, in the morning that started at the University of Cambridge. And in that research that resulted in a paper that's already published, I confirmed the hypothesis that the, the incongruity between the independent variable's geography and identity and the dependent variable of the European Union membership as a national security policy can be explained in the Portuguese case by an intervening domestic variable, which is the perceptions of the Portuguese geopolitical agent. That means that although geography of Portugal, as we are going to see, is pretty much oriented to the sea, although the traditional narratives and the identity of the people are also oriented to the sea, the result of the behavior of the state is oriented to the land. So my explanation is that this orientation to the land is explained by the action of these perceptions and capacities of the Portuguese geopolitical agent, which are shaped by the European Union principles and norms. And these are the determinant that then affects the, the behavior and the, the positioning of the state. <clears throat> so there is not much to discuss about this. So Portugal has been a traditional sea power until 1974. This orientation towards the sea started at the end of the 14th century, beginning of the 20th century, and then lasted until 1974. Uh, we will come back to this point later on. But first, let's contextualize the geography of the country using two geopolitical factors, space and position. First, space. The Portuguese uh, territory has a shape of a compact rectangle which, with very low uh, territorial strategic depth. So it is relatively close between uh, the border with Spain and the Atlantic coastline, so there is not much of space uh, for maneuver. So this means that the country needed to look for space somewhere else. The country has roughly 1,793 kilometers of coastline, which is quite broad. This coastline uh, offers some physical opportunities to have very big ports, uh, relatively. Uh, I list the, 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 the majority of them there, Leixões, Atlaire, Lisboa, Setúbal, and Sines. Sines is the most important, I will talk about Sines in a couple of minutes. <coughs> also, the exclusive economic zone of Portugal and the islands is more than 1.7 million uh, square kilometers. So that you may have an idea, I brought you here a map with Portugal and the islands of Madeira and Açores. So this is a very, very big space and this actually is a case of uh, prof what Professor Strauss in the morning said of countries that have much bigger land, much bigger sea, sorry, than, than land, it's the obvious case of Portugal. And it is in the land, in the sea space, that Portugal faces some uh, opportunity to have strategic depth, so from the west to the east, in, a, in an opportunity to it all. <clears throat> so also the, the rivers, the majority of the rivers of Portugal are oriented from the east to the west, so orienting the country also to uh, the Atlantic Ocean, therefore to the sea. As for position, the location of Portugal made it a maritime country since the very beginning, so even before it was Portugal, uh, so in the Roman times and afterwards there were already maritime peoples coming to this uh, place that would be later on Portugal and teaching know-how in terms of uh, sailing techniques and how to build ships. Plus, uh, the position of Portugal today from the American perspective uh, is in the position of a gateway to Europe and those islands that I just mentioned, the Soros, they are anachronically or in rough comparative terms like a choke point between Europe and the United States. And this is perhaps one of the most important factors that Portugal has on its favor, 
via the importance of this silence both for navigation and also for uh, airlines and air supply. Uh, finally, concerning the position, it's also relevant to note that the south of Portugal, uh, which is called Algarve, is oriented to the, one of the most important choke points in Europe and also in the world, which is the Strait of Gibraltar that holds the control to the entrance of the Mediterranean Sea. It's the only natural entrance, as we know. The other one is artificial in the Suez Canal. And the third one, the Bosphorus and Dardanelles, leads to nowhere due to the uh, Black Sea being a semi-closed sea. I will jump here on the part of identity, because the time is just passing by. Uh, I would just like to uh, emphasize this aspect, is that even if the territorial dismantlement of Portugal that happened in 1974 uh, happened in that, uh, in that date, even afterwards, in the 80s and the 90s, uh, the majority of the literature for the just strategy of Portugal still insisted on the matters of the sea to which Portugal should go back to. So even if the, the political events led the country in one direction, the literature and scientific production still remain in the fact of the necessity of Portugal orienting its foreign policy towards the sea. When we look at the foreign policy pattern, <clears throat> we would see that virtually all the allies of Portugal have been or are maritime countries, like the UK, the former provinces and states that today are independent Portuguese-speaking countries in America, Africa, Asia and Oceania, obviously the United States and the alliance in NATO since 1949, and also Japan. So I will also skip this slide here to enter here in the foreign policy shape. So what happened in 1974? It happened the most dramatic transformation in the Portuguese foreign policy conduct. There was a regime change, change and the geopolitical agents of the previous regime called Estado Novo were removed from power and replaced by other geopolitical agents. First, uh, communist geopolitical agents and then after the counter coup. Uh, democratic. But the main point that uh, matters for us here and for this paper in particular is that the orientation of the country uh, took place then at this, at this time. So from the so-called decolonization uh, process and therefore the dismantlement of Portuguese territoriality to uh, becoming a rectangle with 90,000 uh, uh, square uh, kilometers plus these two group of islands, and therefore uh, orienting itself to Brussels, expecting funds and also uh, political uh, protection and uh, economic profitability. So this is uh, the date to keep in mind, this is 1974. Because of this shift, obviously the uh, two main activities connected to the sea uh, started suffering a process of decay. You have there two tables concerning fishing activity and Portuguese Navy that illustrate this fact. For example, randomly, the total amount of landed fish decreased from 165,000 to 137. And this 137,000 tons, this represents 25% of the fish consumed in Portugal. So 25% uh, in a country that has uh, 1,700 uh, kilometers of coastline. So it's a rather odd uh, situation. The same is for the Portuguese Navy. If we would, for example, compare here the total number of war vessels in 1972 with uh, 2,090, from 160 to 41. Of course, we cannot forget that in 1972 Portugal was at war with the guerrilla in Africa. So there must be a correcting parameter, but nevertheless it's, uh, it's a very big uh, decrease. So what could be the amount of possibilities for Portugal concerning this traditional relation with the sea and bringing this back to the 21st century? Well, I brought you here two possibilities and two scenarios. The first possibility is the creation of a ferry connection between Portugal and the UK. Actually, this year, uh, earlier this year, in February, I believe, Brittany Ferries that you have there in a picture expressed interest to, uh, to connect Porto 
which is a city in the north of Portugal, to Plymouth in the UK, because Spain closed its ports because of the COVID pandemic. But in the meantime, Spain decided to open the ports and Portugal lost this uh, opportunity and Brittany Ferries didn't uh, express interest in this project uh, anymore. But nevertheless, with another company or even with more uh, business interests, perhaps this uh, Brittany Ferries plan could be brought back again. Another possibility is to uh, make this Sinish port that I already referred when I talked about geography, uh, to make it as a hub for supplying uh, Western European countries, and I mean by this mainly energy and manufactured goods. However, uh, to, to make that a reality, foreign policy and uh, for, uh, strategic planners need obviously to construct a proper a railway connecting the port to the port of Spain, because this uh, blue line that we have here, this is just a, a proposal for a railway, so this doesn't exist. So th this is the same to say that the train to uh, travel from Sinish to Spain needs to cross more than a third of Portugal, which makes very little sense from a strategic and economic point of view. So this is uh, an infrastructure that would need to be required in order to make full potential of this uh, Sinish port. Uh, the reason why it is uh, more important than the other ports is because it's the deepest waters. So uh, the biggest ships that go deeper in the ocean can use uh, this port, unlike the others. In the very unlikely case of a departure, so Portugal leading uh, the European Union as the United Kingdom did, Obviously, restoring the Portuguese membership in EFTA would be the logical step to take in order to have some um, international trade agreement. And also, in that same unlikely scenario of uh, Portugal moving out from the UK, building a unique state, a partnership or a union state with Brazil would be also a possibility, as the Russians and the Belarusians already did and or also creating the, the, the diamond of the Lusosphere on the Atlantic Ocean, as I call it. So, a diamond here with four vertices, one in Portugal, one in Brazil, the third in Angola, and the fourth one in Antarctica, using the decades-long interest of Brazil in Antarctica. So, I will just wrap up and conclude. So, there is a dualism and contradiction to be noted in the Portuguese case. If the ocean transatlantic relations and the alliance with the United States and the UK and the Lusosphere did not vanish from the Portuguese political discourse, the entire geopolitical design is, and all things being equal, it will continue to be ultimately decided underneath the interests of the European Union uh, foreign and security policy. With regard to Europeanization, in the case of Portugal, it seems that the crucial reality is downloading. So, Portugal is a classic example of a norm taker. In this context, in which the role of geography, history, and traditional institutions and narratives do not count much in determining the state's preferences, the Portuguese fishing activity and the Navy have been in, decade, in decay for decades. The possibilities and scenarios for Portugal as a yeah. sea power-oriented country can involve yeah. maritime lines with the UK and the United States, developing its ports and railway network, and also an EFTA membership and union state with Brazil in case in the unlike case of a departure scenario. But these just scenarios and possibilities are only achievable once the industrial and naval capacity of Portugal are are reinstated and improved, which is also very unlikely, at least for the next years to come. So, thank you very much for your attention, and I will leave by uh, now. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your interesting presentation, Dr. Mugada. Thank you. And now I'm giving floor to our second speaker, George Duja, PhD candidate in political science from Faculty of Political Science, University of Bucharest, Romania. Mr. 
Excuse me, we have some technical problems. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yes, can you hear me now? Now I can hear you. I'm going to ask you to start from the beginning. Thank you. Just a second to start my presentation. Sure. Uh, so it concerns a case study of the Romania, an Eastern European country, and the strategies for survival. Okay, can you see it? Yes, very well. Is it okay? Yes. Yes. Okay, so uh, I started my uh, research from uh, the study of the central concept developed in order to evaluate state, uh, mainly power. And then I'm uh, relying here on the Realist School of International Relations. So, according to Raymond Aron, power can be defined in three different manners coercion capacity, concrete resources, effectively mobilized resources. So, uh, if an actor, which usually in geopolitics it is a great power, possesses a certain coercive force, that gives it a comparative advantage over the others. Uh, at the level of small states, the interest is rather survival at the international level. So, for this, they can choose uh, three main strategies to level. So, uh, first is balancing, so creating alliances to resist uh, any threat to their security. Or, they can pass this responsibility to other significant actors, a uh, strategy called backpassing. Or, they can even make an alliance with the threatening force in the hope that this this way they would be spared from, uh, from extermination. So it's bandwagoning, as it was called in the literature. So, uh, I started my presentation with a small historical legacy of the Romanian um, state. So, uh, uh, on the territory of the Romanian state, there were some of three small Danubian Carpathian principalities in the medieval time under the forms of Transylvania, Moldavia, and Wallachia. And they were established as Eastern defense marches by the Hungarian kingdom. However, uh, in time they evolved to be some small entities surviving the menace of uh, great powers in their neighborhood, mainly the Ottoman Empire, the Hungarian and Polish kingdoms, and later the Austrian Empire. So, uh, I have uh, selected some uh, decisive events in the history of this principality. And, uh, and uh, then uh, I, uh, I uh, analyzed which was the most successful strategy for their survival. And uh, this, uh, following the statistical analysis, this was bandwagoning and to a small extent backpacking. Uh, so, this could be a legacy for modern Romania from the historical background. Uh, what is interesting is any attempt to balance against great powers always ended in failure and this is mainly due to their situation in a continental area surrounded by great powers so the chances of resistance were very small even if they were even united at some point in 1600. So this is a, a summary table with the main historical events for each principality which I selected, and each one uh, ended in either survival or defeat and loss of status and autonomy. So, as you can see, the bandwagon strategy was the most successful while balancing didn't succeed at all. So, coming to Romania, from the beginning, this was a geopolitical project favored by great powers in the 19th century because that this was supported by the local elites alliance which was seen to be the most uh, profitable strategy to get to the, the interests of small companies, such small entities uh, realized. So the most achievements of Romanian leading elites in the 19th century 
which were the organic regulations, uh, the first constitutions in Wallachia and Moldavia, and the Union of Moldavia and Wallachia leading to Romania in 1859, the independence in 1877, and the proclamation of kingdom, came as a result of alliances with uh, one major European great power, uh, first of all Russia in the beginning, and uh, in the independence moment, then with France, which had uh, uh, special relations because the elites were trained in Paris at that time, most of them, and then with Germany, which became the dominant power on the continent. Gradually, in the 20th century, Romania began to become a balancing country, especially in the Balkans, and this was uh, proved in the Second Balkan War in 1913 when it shifted the balance in a decisive manner. And also in the First World War, it chose again a bandwagoning strategy with the Entente uh, in order to uh, gain territory, which was uh, its main aim to unite with Transylvania. As a result, it redoubled the territory after the Paris Peace Treaties, and uh, this is how Greater Romania, as it was called, emerged. In the interwar period, uh, taking into account that it became a, large, a, a little bit larger country, but not a great power, it attempted to create some balancing alliances of small states from Central and Eastern Europe, such as the Little Entente and the Balkan Pact. But these alliances ultimately failed in the wake of the Second World War. Uh, due to the continental circumstances, uh, Romania, for the next uh, half of a century, was forced uh, to ally with the strongest uh, country in its uh, region. First with Nazi Germany, which was uh, successful in the beginning of the Second World War, then switching sides in 1944, as the war became uh, favorable to the Allies, and in the end, uh, it, uh, it became a satellite country of the Soviet Union, which became the dominant power here. And as a satellite country, it became a founding member of the Comic-Con and the Warsaw Treaty Organization. However, after the Soviet troops were withdrawn in 1958, Romania had some attempts at the autonomous foreign policy following the Yugoslav and Chinese communist dissidences, and even developed preferential relations with some Western countries such as France, West Germany, United States, and Israel. But this was rather related to uh, the personal rule of uh, President Nikolai Ceausescu, which ultimately failed because his attempt to pay off foreign debts and uh, submitting the country to fierce austerity eventually led to the 1989 Romanian Revolution and the fall of the communist regime. Uh, so, during the 1990s, Romania reoriented towards the West and established good relations with all its neighbors as its main objective became NATO and EU membership. So Romania became NATO member in 2004 after uh, nine years in the NATO Partnership for Peace. And as a NATO member state, it participated to the alliance's intervention in Afghanistan with a total of 32,000 soldiers during 20 years time span, of which 27 were killed in action, and also with civilian personnel in Iraq. So within NATO, the main alliance that Romania concluded was a strategic partnership, uh, again a bandwagon strategy, uh, with the United States, which was seen as the main military power in Europe, and it even allowed American military personnel and equipment in its military bases as a means to deter Russian threats to its security. Also in 2007, Romania became a member of the European Union alongside Bulgaria, following some partnerships with major member states, like France, Germany, Italy, and United Kingdom. Uh, after becoming an EU member state, Romania agreed to renounce uh, part of its sovereignty, apart from the normal EU sovereignty by accepting control verification mechanism on justice. However, the advantage of EU membership was gaining uh, access to vital funding and jobs in Western Europe, and actually, Nowadays, the Romanian diaspora in Europe is around 4 million people. 
and currently it is the sixth member state after Brexit within the Union. Uh, as uh, an alliance strategy within the European Union, during the last years, Romania has been developing cooperation with the fellow EU member states of the Visegrad Group in the Visegrad Plus a variant of this, uh, of this group, and also in the informal Friends of Cohesion Group, opposed to the Frugal Four, which supports uh, allow, allocating funds, uh, continue to allocate funds for the least developed regions of Europe. Uh, but also all of this in the context of accepting the EU leadership of the main member states, Germany, France, Italy, so less, uh, less to the contesting the behavior like the Visegrad group usually does. You, here it's a table with uh, this, uh, this is a summary of the main historical moments. Uh, and, uh, in conclusion is that uh, Ben Wagoning was again, as the historical legacy uh, continued, it was the best strategy for the survival of Romania state and of achieving its uh, goals, its main goals. So, as a conclusion, the main survival strategy of Romania as a small country has been to conclude the alliance with stronger countries which could support its interest against other strong countries menacing it. So, even if at some point it's attempting alliances with other small countries in the region, in order to build on bigger blocks, these initiatives ultimately fail. Uh, it could never afford strategies of bug passing, for example, to stay neutral because uh, it was not small enough to be ignored by the great powers in the region. So uh, this is the strategy of the Romanian state was to ally the bandwagon to the most powerful international actor in the European power equation. Thank you. Mr. Dirja, thank you so very much for your very interesting presentation and we are proceeding uh, with our third speaker. I'm cordially inviting uh, Danadan Hanti, PhD student from University of uh, Wroclaw, Poland, uh, to present a uh, presentation entitled China's Belt and Road Initiative, the political challenge for Central and Eastern European countries. Please, the floor is yours. is not with us for a moment and I'm offering to proceed with our next presentation uh, presented by our speakers Mate Zala and Nicolette Garay. Uh, Mate Zala is Senior Research Fellow at the Institute for Foreign Affairs and Trade from Budapest and Nicolette Garay is Research Fellow from Institute for Foreign Affairs and Trade uh, also from Budapest, and their presentation is entitled Visegrad's Soft Power, Examining the Virtual Enlargement of the Visegrad Group. Please, the floor is yours. Welcome. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. It's a great pleasure for us to be here. My name is Mate Sari and my colleague is Nicolette. Uh, we work at the Cornish University and the Institute for Affairs and Trade and we decided to present our research uh, together because we worked on it uh, together as a joint effort. So basically, uh, this does not work. Maybe if you put it on a slideshow, then it can work. Can, uh, can, can we ask uh, the person to put it on a slideshow? Slideshow is perfect because the uh, Viking Arts next slideshow, third week slideshow. Oh, all right, it's working now. Thank you very much. Uh, so basically, our uh, uh, research is focusing on the uh, Visegrad countries, which are, of course, Poland, uh, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, and um, Hungary. And 
especially since 2015, there are, uh, the role of the Visegrad countries in the European Union and in the international society is quite uh, debated. There are many conflicting narratives regarding their position. Uh, many people argue that, especially after the refugee or the migration crisis of 2015, uh, the Visegrad countries be became the bad boys of Europe and they are going against the current, they are going against the mainstream uh, of, of the EU. Others argue that uh, due to their illiberal and populist tendencies, the Visegrad countries became isolated in the international society, while others contradicting to these narratives, others argue that uh, it was especially in this period when the Visegrad countries managed to enlarge their importance in the international sphere by presenting, uh, um, confronting attitudes toward the European um, consensus. So we basically wanted to make these narratives clash in the arena of empirical uh, data and we posed three uh, research questions. Have the V4 countries increased their political weight in the European Union between 2014 and, 2000, uh, and 2018? Naturally, since time passed, we changed this, to, this time frame to, uh, to uh, last until 2020. Secondly, has the perception of the V4 in the European International Community changed? either in a positive or a negative way. And thirdly, uh, can we see differences between uh, the position of the specific Visegrad countries? And uh, we don't want to get deep into the literature, we just wanted to mention a couple of pieces which, uh, uh, on the basis of which we conducted our study. Naturally, we have Alan Chong's uh, um, argument regarding the virtual enlargement strategy of small states, which is basically uh, describing a, uh, a, a specific toolkit, a soft power toolkit for small states to enlarge their importance in the international society. Secondly, we are also uh, focusing on, on uh, Victor Giglo's uh, national, uh, national role conception, which connects identity uh, with the role played by small states in the international uh, sphere. And when it comes to the defining small states, we used our own definition from a couple of uh, years ago. Naturally, that was also based on the literature. And in, in, in this framework, we defined small states as those countries whose territory, population, economic capacity, as well as military capabilities are under the average of a given region. So in this case, this given region is the EU, and we can see that all four, I mean, three out of the four Visegrad states fit this definition, except for uh, Poland, uh, but uh, when it comes to the behavior of Poland, we will see that there are many uh, uh, similarities between these four states. Now I pass the word to my colleague to describe the methodology. Okay, this. thank you very much, uh, Marty. So uh, we have to talk a bit about uh, methodology. I will mention only a couple of things because we don't really have much time to go uh, into the deep issues. So we have established basically three different um, operational questions to be, at, to be able to answer the original questions. Uh, those were a bit abstract, so we had to find uh, another level of abstraction. Um, okay, so I cannot really see uh, the presentation anymore, uh, which is a problem, um, but uh, nonetheless, uh, I can carry on. So we tried to do a discourse analysis and we wanted to analyze uh, the international discourse in which the V4 countries uh, appear. Um, we analyzed the tensions of cooperations and confrontations with V4 countries and by that uh, we uh, wanted to see speech acts uh, by governmental representatives which were made uh, towards or about the V4 uh, countries and uh, the source, uh, what we used, uh, were found in the so-called GDAT database, which, uh, which is the global database on events, language and tone. It is a real-time uh, platform which uh, monitors real-time uh, the words uh, broadcast uh, and uh, news uh, media uh, from, from the web and from uh, offline media as well, over from 100 uh, different languages. So um, it's really indeed big data. We had a bit of a problem uh, because our laptops were not able to uh, run queries which we needed in order to get the data. So we had to use the special computers in order to get uh, uh, all of the uh, queries. So basically we had these three different types of operational questions. 
Uh, we are asking in our paper that has the number of cooperative and confrontational interactions expressed in the direction of the, one of the Visegrad countries increased between the given period in relative terms. And also we uh, discuss in the paper whether did the ratio of confrontation and interactions change compared to all interactions made by uh, the European states. And based on these two above indicators, uh, we wanted to find out whether the V4 countries have the same dynamics or not. Talking about uh, the few of our results, again, I cannot change the slides. Um, it seems that our PPT was uh, not compatible with <laughs> something. Uh, yeah, so basically, uh, let, me sh let us share a couple of results uh, with you. Uh, on this slide you can see the uh, overall number of interactions uh, conducted uh, uh, towards the Visegrad countries. So this is an aggregate data for the four countries. And as a general tendency between 1990 and 2012, uh, uh, sorry, 2020, uh, we can see a general decrease in the number of interactions. So, contrary to, uh, to our initial ideas and the title of the presentation, we can not really talk about virtual enlargement, uh, we can see a virtual decrease of the importance of the Visegrad countries. Nevertheless, what we can see uh, here in the 2000s is that this virtual decrease uh, has stopped or stabilized to some extent. Uh, this is also true when it comes to the expressed confrontations, so the uh, confrontative interactions towards the Visegrad countries. Uh, as you can see, we can, uh, there is the same tendency. Nevertheless, the aggregate number of uh, interactions towards the V4 countries are below the EU average, uh, at least since uh, NATO accession of these countries. So we can see that uh, uh, further analysis is needed in this uh, regard. Okay, um, here on uh, the next slide we can see the cooperation with the four V4 countries. Um, you can see the different uh, shades, the Czech Republic, Hungary, Poland and uh, Slovakia. So as Mati has already mentioned, um, it was also a, decree, a gradual decrease after uh, the fall of the communism in the interest of all the V4 countries. But I have to mention here that uh, we are monitoring only um, media reports um, which uh, were focusing uh, interstate relations. So, for example, media reports about uh, cooperation or confrontation with V4 and an international institution like uh, one of the institutions of the European Union is not included in this analysis, unfortunately, but we are uh, hoping that we can include them uh, in, in the future because it is still an ongoing uh, research, to be honest. So we can see that Poland got the most uh, media attention. We can make a conclusion here that is because it's not really a small state than other V4 countries here. And then we can also see that the Czech Republic also gained a lot of media reports. However, when it comes to in, uh, media reports and interactions with Hungary and Slovakia, uh, we can see an interesting uh, tendency in here. Um, that Hungary, after the migration crisis, uh, get into more, uh, getting to start more interactions with other countries of the European Union, whereas Slovakia has a, a sharp decrease. Now we can go to the next slide. Okay, um, this is the, basically similar to the previous uh, slide. Here we would like to show you the confrontation with the Visegrad four countries. Here again, the tendencies are a bit similar. Um, I'd like to mention that one of the most interesting uh, results were he that uh, the domestic political events uh, very much uh, shape media appearances. So if you can see like sharp increases in the data, this is because there were special years when uh, the domestic political issues reached uh, the uh, threshold of, of uh, media and other countries and they started to condemn, for example, what's happening in a given country. So in the database, uh, all of these uh, media reports were coded uh, according to different variables. And for example, we did an event count, which meant that we sampled all of the uh, media reports which were mentioning confrontation or cooperation towards V4 uh, countries. Ok, 
Okay, and then we also made a comparison between uh, the confrontation of V4 countries uh, compared to all confrontations of the European uh, Union. And you can see here that there are certain years again. For example, the year of 2006, uh, where this uh, V4 ratio is much better than uh, it was to the European Union. 2006 was an interesting year for all of the V4 countries, like issues like uh, protests in Hungary against the government happened in that year. Also, um, in Poland, the uh, former president uh, Lech Kaczynski uh, called for the reintroduction of death penalty in Europe. So, uh, this also again was a topic which uh, raised eyebrows uh, in many countries. But that's just a few examples. We don't really have time to uh, basically get into the, uh, the, the ideas why these discrepancies are part uh, of this chart. Okay. And there, here again, uh, we just wanted to show you this, uh, this chart to, see, to show you that uh, how scattered uh, the different V4 countries' media representations are. Um, and uh, if we go to the next slide, um, based on the above two indicators, we were able to make some um, conclusions on the dynamics. So mostly they have uh, the same dynamics, um, and uh, this is because uh, they have similar positions in the, in the international society. However, there are uh, certain particularities, like for example, Hungary's growing role since uh, the outbreak of, of the mi migration crisis. So we were able to identify through the media reports that, um, that interactions, both uh, cooperational and confrontational, uh, um, increased a bit in towards Hungary. In the same time, we could, uh, we could conclude that we, we observed the decline of Slovakia's importance. Uh, which is the most, one of the most visible uh, results in here, and also the fluctuating domestic politics, uh, like for example in Slovakia that you were able to see in the previous chart, um, they are uh, basically showing this fluctuating uh, ratio. And uh, concluding the presentation, we arrived to four specific uh, conclusions. One is that uh, the Visegrad countries had a virtual decline in their importance since uh, uh, 1990, basically, but this virtual decline uh, was stabilized um, in the last five years, let's say, and their importance is basically studied uh, at the same level of interactions. Secondly, there is a huge importance of domestic politics, because it seems that at least bilateral interactions uh, are fluctuating based on a specific domestic political crises and so on, so they are not connected to international political developments. Third, uh, we also tried to, uh, to calculate the correlation between various aspects of size and the number of interactions in Europe, and it seemed that the, the biggest correlation we can see is uh, between uh, the number of interactions and the size of the military budget which was very, very surprising to us. Military budget has a bigger explanatory role, at least according to this correlation. Um, uh, so it has bigger, uh, it has bigger role than, uh, for example, uh, population or economic size, which is, which is quite surprising. Uh, nevertheless, we also have to bear in mind the methodological limitations we faced during this uh, research. For example, Nikki mentioned that uh, we are monitoring media reports. Also, we are focusing on, on bilateral interactions and not multilateral interactions. So, in order to investigate those, we need a separate research. Uh, so, thank you very much, and we are looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so very much for sharing with us your very interesting and important research. And we are proceeding with our last speaker for today, uh, Mr. Howard Turnbull-Skanyan, PhD student at the School of Social Sciences, Political Science and Administration from University of Warsaw, to present his speech on small state versus big challenges, the peculiarities of national security policy of Latvia. Mr. Voskanyan, the floor is yours. We can't hear you for... Uh -huh. now. Up now, yes. yes. Uh, I'm very happy to be uh, part of uh, this workshop, to be the part of this event, and I'm, very, I'm feeling very happy to be hosted by uh, my uh, own home university. Okay, as uh, time is running, I'll start uh, my presentation. 
Is it visible? Can you see my presentation there? Yes, we can. Yes, mm -hmm. that's great. Great. Now I will start. <clears throat> Uh, my topic is about uh, small states uh, versus uh, big challenges, especially I was focused on the uh, Latvian case. Um, I was really interested in, um, the, in, the, in the topic uh, because uh, there are some states which, don't have, uh, which are not involved in uh, military conflicts or conventional wars, but they uh, still uh, face some external threats and uh, challenges and they drive their own national policy. I was interested to find out how some states uh, without uh, the conventional war engagement uh, draft and drive their uh, national uh, security policy. And uh, from my own perspective, Latvia was one of the, the interesting cases because um, it is quite unique and uh, interesting case. Uh, unfortunately, it was always uh, studied simultaneously with other uh, two Baltic states, but I was, um, I tried to focus mostly on this case uh, <clears throat> and to find the deeper roots, uh, causes which uh, determine uh, for, um, for having certain type of uh, behavior and the expression of this behavior was uh, reflected on uh, their uh, national security uh, policy. Uh, 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 I, for, for this particular reason, I used content analysis, uh, mostly focusing on primary and secondary sources, and in order to understand uh, um, deeply the world uh, and understand deeply the roots uh, of the problem, I wanted to combine multiple um, interpretations uh, uh, for uh, covering the wall, uh, for covering the wall mm -hmm. perception, the white perception of this topic, uh, following through the uh, periods of uh, discourses in uh, Soviet era, in pre-Soviet era, in, in the period of uh, independent. Uh, independence is, uh, since 1991. Uh, the structure of my topic uh, is divided in the following. There is introduction, historical or review of overview, uh, internal challenges, uh, then I focused on uh, the process of uh, independence, how it happened, uh, from dissolution, meaning uh, dissolution from uh, the dissolution of the Soviet Union and uh, policy of securitization, policy of uh, alignment, uh, regional integration, international intelligence, and of course, the uh, summary. Historical overview. Uh, Post Soviet national building process uh, in uh, Latvia. Uh, it's a combination of several aspects. Uh, mainly, it's um, heritage. It's, uh, it's a dark, um, uh, sometimes dark uh, pages, historical pages of a common history with Russia, uh, with the Soviet Russia, and um, meanwhile, uh, the new identity, independent identity of Latvians, uh, was resulted by anti-communist behavior of uh, certain youth. Uh, Activist, uh, it was uh, also uh, a combination of uh, not deep assessment of historical uh, of their own historical pa past. I mean, a period of Second World War and um, history uh, related to some collaborators uh, with the uh, Waffen SS Nazi Germany. Uh, there are uh, uh, common uh, discrepancies uh, with the uh, Soviet uh, legacy. For example, one of the uh, vivid and uh, a vivid example of uh, these discrepancies is uh, the history about Lat uh, Latvian riflemen uh, who were formed uh, during uh, Tsar, uh, during First World War, and uh, after October Revolution, they uh, joined to Bolsheviks and uh, in, the, in the Soviet Union uh, they were uh, quite famous of uh, their punitive actions. So uh, for some cases Bolshevik, uh, uh, Bolshevik legacy, Bolshevik uh, literature uh, initiated some heroization of uh, this uh, rifleman, uh, but the Latvian side uh, was uh, quite skeptic and uh, for example on the place of museum of uh, Latvian uh, rifleman which was 
uh, founded in Soviet period, now the Museum of Occupation. So we understand that uh, in terms of occupation, they uh, mean the occupation by, initiated by the Soviet Russia. Uh, so, uh, for forcible accession of uh, Latvia during Second World War was uh, one of the dark uh, pages and the points of uh, having troubles uh, in the bilateral relationship uh, with uh, Russia. Uh, the, as I mentioned, the an ambiguous assessment of uh, Nazi occupation and glorification of uh, two uh, the Latvian as a weapon, as a battalion, in, uh, in, uh, uh, combined by the Latvians, are not uh, done yet, and this is the point of uh, information, uh, information war, information and, uh, clashes, sometimes uh, very hot discussion in both sides. Uh, still, uh, non officially, but still. Uh, uh, in Latvia, they commemorate uh, the day of uh, uh, Latvian uh, legions, two legions, 15 and 90 legions, uh, which is the uh, point of uh, hot discussion, as I mentioned. Um, internal challenges. Um, in some cases, a Russian speaker uh, minorities, which are not only Russian, but they are Ukrainian, Belarusian, uh, Polish, Jews, and uh, all other post-Soviet uh, ethnicities, nationalities, sometimes uh, considered as the um, as, uh, as challenge for uh, Latvian state uh, policy uh, because uh, they are mostly influenced by Russian and they are mostly influenced by Russian television. And for this uh, particular purpose, uh, Latvia uh, terminated a couple of years ago since uh, since. Uh, outbreak of crisis in Ukraine, they uh, terminated the uh, broadcasting of um, certain national TV channels, Russian TV channels, uh, considering as the tools for propaganda. Uh, there are still uh, non-citizens uh, in uh, Latvia. We, uh, there are people who have not uh, recognized as nationality, uh, the, the national of, uh, the, the, they do not have the Latvian nationality, they have uh, so-called green passports, uh, which uh, uh, which uh, gives them uh, uh, which uh, give them quite a uh, broad opportunity to be flexible to travel around 90 days easily on the territory of EU, and uh, they don't need a visa for Russian Federation. So uh, people are quite uh, feeling comfortable with this. Uh, but however, this is uh, this is one of the hot uh, internal um, uh, topics for, for discussion and uh, discourse. Mm, the crisis in Ukraine uh, accelerated and uh, raised the. Uh, Concern of Latvia about information security, about the uh, possibility of uh, Russia to intervene to the Baltic region. Uh, so they, uh, in many cases, they changed their approaches and uh, uh, policy uh, the, towards uh, towards information security and uh, amplified and for uh, and uh, as, uh, started to cooperate uh, with the other to uh, Baltic states in terms of information security, checking, analyzing, and uh, trying to uh, bring uh, proof evidence of the facts uh, in order to prevent uh, hybrid warfare. Uh, so they use this uh, type of uh, countermeasures. One of the internal challenges is so demographic decline in, uh, and the labor uh, migration in Latvia. Uh, from distribution to securitization of uh, Latvia. Uh, since 1991, when Latvia became independent, uh, they, uh, they uh, um, stayed uh, quite skeptic towards Russia and uh, uh, Western integration uh, paradigm or dimension uh, has not any alternative for them. And uh, NATO um, process of uh, NATO membership has started uh, in the uh, 90s. And in the 2004, uh, they uh, became uh, the member of uh, NATO. Uh, meanwhile, uh, they became the member of European Union as well. Uh, so two strategic uh, directions were uh, considered as highly important for Latvia, NATO and EU. 
because due to NATO, they had opportunity to made a serious reform, say in uh, uh, in military, in the army, uh, in the sector of uh, defense. Uh, they founded the uh, Air Force uh, Mobility uh, Center in Leilwarde. Uh, so it uh, functions as uh, one of the effective uh, uh, air defense uh, institution and uh, uh, base uh, on the territory of Latvia. Uh, Latvia hosted uh, EFP Enhanced Forward uh, Presence uh, Initiative and uh, they um, uh, hosted one of four multinational battles as the battle groups, uh, which are uh, located dislocated on the eastern flank uh, of uh, NATO from uh, from Estonia to Poland. Uh, regional integration. Regional integration. They started uh, to participate in a different type of uh, economic, political, environmental. Uh, initiatives of the region uh, using all opportunities to feel uh, closer to uh, Europe and uh, uh, Western community. Um, uh, Trimarium, which is uh, now one of the ambitious, uh, uh, ambitious uh, projects uh, proposed and uh, driven by Poland, uh, Latvia became a part of this Trimarium, which is the expression of um, the theoretical model of the concept uh, drafted by um, uh, head of uh, uh, head of uh, Polish uh, state during the interwar period, uh, Joseph Pilsudski, uh, the expression of his uh, Poseidonism uh, ideas uh, was the uh, was the creation of uh, a strong uh, community of state former states uh, which belong to uh, the Polish uh, Lithuanian Commonwealth. Uh, so Latvia was uh, the part of uh, this uh, initiative before, and uh, now Trimari, which uh, they integrates three main uh, sea, Baltic, Lake, and uh, Adriatic. Uh, Latvia feeling absolutely integrated to this uh, economic infrastructural uh, initiative. Uh, meanwhile, Latvia is a part of Rail Baltic um, railway uh, project. It is a huge, uh, ambitious uh, infrastructural project uh, funded by the EU and by uh, national states. Uh, but, however, this uh, Rail Baltic, um, which uh, should, uh, which should uh, bond uh, Helsinki, Tallinn, uh, Riga, Vilnius, and Warsaw. Uh, however, this uh, Red Baltica project is, uh, has uh, quite a dual purpose uh, in terms of uh, military uh, challenge, uh, external military challenge, and they consider, of course, uh, Russian um, uh, threats coming from Russia. They can use it not only for uh, logistic of goods, but also for transfer of military forces and troops and uh, equipment. Uh, so, uh, the next uh, regional uh, initiative was security and defense policy, uh, permanent structured cooperation, FESCO, which is the part of uh, European Union security and defense policy, and they are an uh, active uh, member of uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, we can say European Army startup, uh, especially trying to uh, defend uh, the eastern flank. Which is highly important, uh, highly important uh, part of uh, EU and generally we can say for for, for NATO. Uh, some small uh, alliance uh, members are more Atlanticist than others. Uh, this idea was um, uh, was defined by uh, a Danish uh, scholar, professor uh, of Copenhagen University, uh, Anders Bivel, who. Mm, uh, who defined uh, uh, with uh, Matthew, uh, American scholar uh, Matthew Kendall the idea of super Atlanticism that there are some small states which are more Atlantis than others and they defined the idea of super Atlanticist uh, in the, uh, where they consider uh, the, doing a comparative analysis they mostly considered uh, Estonia and Denmark 
but uh, the uh, evaluation of uh, national security policy and foreign policy of Latvia, we can state that uh, Latvia is uh, 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 absolutely matches uh, to all those uh, criteria, criteria which were mentioned in this definition, uh, especially uh, Super Atlantis country consider the absolute role of uh, United States as a uh, only superpower and the world order set up by uh, United States um, uh, do not have any discrepancies by um, uh, allies countries and they always uh, uh, and they will always try to follow the dimension uh, drafted and coordinated by United States so their super Atlantis sees the in uh, contrary to other uh, NATO members uh, differ from their vigorous, ambitious and uh, uh, devotion to common uh, undisputable um, uh, deal, job, policy. This was kind of uh, time is up, I'm so sorry. Uh, I'm so sorry. Uh, one of the main external uh, challenges for uh, Latvia is the uh, Russian neighborhood and uh, uh, they share the common, um, uh, common border with uh, Russia which is about uh, 240 kilometers. And Mr. Voskanyan, our time is up. Oh. May I so much ask you to wrap up? Yeah. Of course. Uh, I'll Thank you. So much. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, uh, mostly uh, Russian neighborhood, uh, the Belarusian neighborhood, uh, which is now the gateway uh, for um, uh, illegal uh, migration, we can say, but I don't like this term, however. Uh, so, and uh, they use uh, they, they use the, their capacity to deter the external uh, challenges coming mostly from their own perception coming from uh, Russia. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ms. Voskanyan. Uh, we very interesting presentation. Thank you so much. And uh, we're well ahead of our time. And now we're stealing time from our coffee break. But if we have questions uh, from our online guests or yes please i've got a question uh, thank you for your really fascinating presentation you implied that um, your findings suggest that military budgets are somehow connected to um, fluctuation in interactions could you please elaborate and make some inferences what this could um, mean this is a potentially um, very interesting finding. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Actually, I would say that we were also surprised by this. Uh, actually, this, we are only talking about correlation, not causality at this point. Uh, so the correlation we can see between the, military, the size of the military budget and the number of interactions is uh, around 0.65. So that's the correlation we're talking about. And when it comes to the size of the economy, it's around 0.55. And when it comes to population size, it's 0.52. So uh, we are yet to examine the, the possible causality chains in this uh, situation, but my guess would be that many bilateral interactions are about a military cooperation. And actually, that's not as surprising as you think about the tendencies in world politics in the last 10 years, I would say. Yeah, I would just add uh, that um, unfortunately, we were not able to include. Uh, multilateral fora in our research because that requires other queries in, in the database but we would like to do that as well so um, we are hoping that we can get like further insights uh, within EU dynamics and the V4 in connection even with uh, military issues and, and military budgetary issues. We don't have questions and we don't have coffee guys so we are proceeding with uh, to our next session in, um, in a, a small break, uh, two five minutes per break, and we'll proceed to the next session. Thank you so very much. You are the best. Thank you.